You're listening to the Joelle Martin Mastery Podcast, home of the two-hour deep dive interview with gold, platinum, and multi-platinum bands, including Stained, Blue Rodeo, The Arkells, Finger Eleven, Big Wreck, Moist, Bedouin Soundclash, I Mother Earth, Hill Scarlet, Neverending White Lights, Thornley, and many more. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast as well as share, comment, and like. Now let's dive in to today's episode. Welcome everyone to today's episode of the podcast. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. We are joined by a very special guest. He's achieved a level of mastery as the keyboard player and backing vocalist for the eight times platinum band Moist. So welcome to the podcast, Kevin Young. Kevin, how are you? And is it true that you are a recovering comic book addict? I am. I was uh, I was quite fond of comic books when I was a kid. Um, you know, uh, my my mother actually I was I was afraid of the water when I was a kid, and my mother actually got me to dunk my head and learn to swim by you know if you put your head under the water, Kevin, I will buy you a comic book. Uh, so yeah, and then I got back into collecting comics when I was uh, in my teens, and and just had to stop. I just had to stop. Uh, and now we've got, you know, the movies, the the whole nine yards. So uh, I get my fix elsewhere. And and what do you think it was about comics as a kid that uh, they got, got you into it? You know, I, I don't know exactly. I, I was always into uh, science fiction and and uh, and into, you know, it's spend hours watching the sky with a buddy of mine when we were kids, you know, hoping to see a UFO or something, you know. Uh, so it was the escapism. But um uh, I obviously learned to read in school, like, like a lot of people did, but I learned to love reading, uh, by reading comic books when I was, you know, six, seven, eight years old. And, and that's been a constant all my life. I'm a, I'm a, a voracious reader. So. And did you draw as well? A lot of people love comics and, and it, it gets them into drawing superheroes or that, that wasn't a gateway drug for you into drawing. Uh, no, I, I was never particularly talented in that direction. I would, I would, I, I did try, but, uh, but I, it was, it, it wasn't my passion. It wasn't something I felt that I was terribly good at. Having said that, I, I have doodled a lot over time as a, as a way to kill time. Awesome. So I, I like to start the interviews by sharing with our listeners how the guests and I ended up here today, just to show the power of, 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 of networking, of building community, of fostering relationships. So in our case, uh, back in June of 2022, on episode number 60 of the podcast, I had your bandmate, Jeff Pierce, basis for Moist. I had him on the podcast for a two-hour deep dive interview. After that, you guys release your your album, End of the Ocean. I had that in my uh, episode number 84, so the top nine albums of 2022. So between those two things, we ended up in the same universe online where you would get tagged in certain things. And then in the last few months, uh, I started bringing out Moist guitarist uh, Jonathan Gallivan to play hockey with me. So now I'm like really in the Moist universe. And he said to me, Hey, I've been checking out some of the podcasts. Love it. Uh, you should really get Kevin on because that guy's got a bunch of awesome stories. And and uh, within, I don't know, within 24 hours of him saying that I should get you on, uh, we had been in touch to set this up. So that's how we got here today. That's our story. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and that's nice of Johnny to say. I hope I won't disappoint. Oh, man, I, I just, you know, you shared a few little stories with me. So I know there's lots of good stuff on the way. And I wanted to kick this off powerfully. So I got some kind words sent in from Jonathan Gallivan himself. So here are some some kind words from your fellow bandmate. This is what Jonathan says. He says, I've never known anyone to take as much time perfecting the tone and quality of their sounds than Kevin. And I think that shows on any recording or live performance he's involved in. He cares a lot about how his components fit within the context of the songs. And that's been such an important part of any Moist or David Usher song, to be sure. I've spent many hours on tour buses and in dressing rooms with Kevin, sharing ideas, heartbreaks, frustrations, and much laughter. I consider him one of my best friends, even though his nickname is The Little Dark Cloud. You'll have to, you'll have yeah. to tell me about that. And he says you should ask him about that one. So that's from Jonathan. Yeah, those are our kind words, and I appreciate that because John is uh, 
uh, John is, uh, you know, John was, is, is the, the, you know, one of the, the new guys in the band because he started with us in 2013. Um, you know, uh, Mark McAway being our, our long time and original guitarist. But uh, John and I, over the course of, the, of years and years, uh, have spent probably more time together than I maybe spent with the other guys in Moist because we've toured so much with David's solo uh, work as well. Isn't it crazy that he's the new guy in the band? And he's been in the band for a decade now. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like he's the new guy in the band, and Francis Filion is is our our uh, our, our drummer. But uh, again, both John and 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 Francis played with David's solo act as well. So we're we're going to do a full two hour deep dive. We're going to go through your your life, your career, your discography, and. I'd like to take it back to the very beginning, just to show our listeners that there's this huge journey. It's like you weren't born into this platinum band moist. It's like there were struggles and, and, and dreams and challenges to overcome. So let's take it all the way back to the beginning. Where, where does this love of music come from? Are, are there any earliest musical memories that come to you when you think back to the beginning? Yeah, there, there are a few. Uh, so as, as we were discussing prior to this, uh, my folks are, are were preachers and uh, my mother was a piano player and they would often uh, when they were doing meetings, uh, I would I would, you know, listen to my mom play. She'd play at home. And I remember she always told me she couldn't improvise, but you would give her a melody and she would be doing this, this comping with her left hand that was just incredible and it fascinated me. So that I think early on watching both my father and my mother sing and play, uh, that was a big thing. Um, and, and actually some of my earliest memories of watching them perform uh, was in, in prison because they worked in correctional services. And so they did meetings in the penitentiaries in Kingston. And uh, so uh, they would, uh, back in the day, in the minimum security prisons, they were allowed to bring me. So I would hang out with the, uh, with the fellas during, while they played, yeah. And, and, and one more thing I should mention, we also had a lot of them being in that line of work, we had a lot of interesting house guests. And I remember they had a Christian band staying with us. Um, uh, and I, I can't remember the name of the band, but I recall talking to them while they were all getting ready for their gig in the washroom, one guy shaving, one guy's poking his head through the shower, uh, another guy is getting dressed. And when you had asked me that question, it was one of those things that it's one of my earliest memories of what it meant to be in a band. And, and that stuck with me. So the, the interest in music starts with the parents. At what point did you think that you also wanted to play music, not just enjoy what your parents are doing, but you actually gravitate towards maybe playing piano. Uh, well, I was, I was, I was basically told that I was going to learn the piano. Uh, so I, I did. Uh, um, and you know, my brother, uh, listened to a lot of, uh, in the, in the seventies, he listened to a lot of prog rock. He listened to a lot. Of, so I'd hear a lot of music through him. And then I discovered Kiss and I was like, uh, and and Rush and and all these other bands of that time period. And I was like, this is this is what I want to do. This is all I want to do. And so that was from there. I, I moved forward from that way. I didn't want to play piano initially it, as I wanted to learn guitar. Uh, but uh, as my parents were transferred around a fair bit, I set up guitar lessons, had myself an electric guitar. It was all ready to start. And we got transferred from uh from where we were living to another city. So stuck with piano. You know, what's funny is, uh, so I'm going on a hundred interviews now and Kiss comes up more than any other band is an influence that got people started. And it's, it's guests of all ages. I mean, I have, you know, Anthony Carone from the Arkells and he's saying it was Kiss, even though he's quite a bit younger than a lot of the other guests. And uh, there's probably been four or five uh, guests that have said Kiss is the band that made them want to do it. So what is it about Kiss that brings that out in everybody? I, you know, I, I, there are a lot of different things. The, initially, it's just the the madness of of the makeup and the fire breathing and the blood spitting and the, you know, and the, and the staging. I was a big Alice Cooper fan as well. So all of that was, you know, 
uh, very important for me, but, but it's the songs too. Because those songs, when you, when you listen to them now, they, they kind of still hold up. They, they, you listen to some of those classic tunes and, it, and you're bobbing your head. You're, yeah, this is, I, I don't know. It was just, it was the whole package. It was unlike anything I'd seen before. And Kiss was like a gateway drug into, uh, you know, into other bands that were more theatrical and, and, and uh, more musically experimental. And, you know, it's just after I saw that as a kid, I just wanted more. I saw the most random uh, double bill that had Kiss on it. And and I know Moist a few years ago played Blues Fest here in Ottawa. Uh, so I was at Blues Fest, I don't know, 15 years ago. And I saw Ice Cube, the rapper, open for Kiss, just to show you how wild some festivals are. We have actually opened for Kiss. Uh, we, uh, we played a show, I want to say in Calgary or in Edmonton. And it was us, the cult, and Kiss. And uh, Francis, myself, Francis, our drummer, myself, and uh, our then bass player, before, when Jeff was taking a break from the band, Lewis, uh, Lila and Seth snuck into a picture with Kiss. And I was right beside Gene Simmons. And I was like, I, you know, I, I couldn't help myself. I look, I, I'm such a big fan. I did, you know, I did the whole thing. And uh, it was this long receiving line of pictures they were doing. And all Gene said was, <clears throat> So that was my brush with one of my childhood heroes. That's amazing. I'm glad it lived up. Glad it lived up to the hype. Um, <laughs> so, so you learning to play piano uh, with your mom as a piano player. Was that your first teacher? You were learning from her. She was my first teacher. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and and was it basically it was her that taught you, and then you got good enough to go on your own, or did you have other teachers along well, the way? She taught me, and she took me to a place where she felt. Um, I would benefit from, from another teacher, which is, you know, as, as you're learning an instrument or learning a skill, it's good to have a variety of different teachers. You learn a different, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, you, a lot of, you learn a lot of different approaches, practice hacks, uh, that sort of thing. So my mom taught me to the point where she felt that in order for someone to direct me and for me, you know, frankly, to listen to them more, uh, they had to bring someone else. So, uh, so I, 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 I learned from a fellow named Mr. Tubby, who had solid the, name, solid name. Yeah, largest fingers I've ever seen. Played beautifully. Uh, could was always shocked by how this big, big man could just fit his fingers on the keys. Um, and I, but I had a variety of teachers over time, and uh, I took conservatory for a while, and and uh, Royal Conservatory for a while, and that sort of thing. So it's it's all over the map for me. Who do you say were your biggest influences as a piano player growing up? So not the, the, the teachers that you learned from, but just seeing, like you said, you know, Kiss inspired you uh, from the big artists that had keyboard players, piano players. Were there any like legends that you looked up to that inspired you to, to practice and get better? You know, most of my my early uh, musical heroes were guitar players. <laughs> so... Um, uh, so I, 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 you know, there were guitarists that I really looked up to, um, but I also, I also would apply that to piano. Like I wanted to be able to achieve some of what these guitar players would do on their guitars on piano. Um, but there were uh, piano players who, who were a big influence on me. And, uh, you know, one of them being uh, Burton Cummings. I, I listened to a lot of the Guess Who when I was when I was younger. Uh, I also was really into key keyboards that were, um, uh, you, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, the keyboard work in, in Who songs, particularly from Who's Next, really struck me. Um, John Lord, big influence. Um, I mean, the, over the years, I've, I've kind of gathered a variety of them, but when I was younger, it was mostly sort of the 70s rock gods, you know? And who would you say were the, the guitarists that you were really into? Mm. Um, well, it, it varied. Um, you know, there were, there were any, it, Rush was a huge influence for me. So Alex Lyson, um, but listening to that band, it's hard to say, you know, Alex Lyson was a big influence on me because Neil Peart and the drumming and the lyrics were a huge influence on me and, and Getty Lee, the singing and the, 
the lead bass, if you will, you know, that was a huge influence on me. And I, when I heard Rush, that's the thing that wanted, started me getting writing music. Cause I was like, yeah, it doesn't have to be three minutes. It can be 20, it can be 30, it can be whatever, you know, it, it opened up something for me. Yeah, I mentioned Kiss seems to be one of the bands that gets people, you know, gets musicians going at, at an early age. And I would say Rush is probably the other one that comes up in all the interviews. It it reminds me recently, I had Gordy Johnson of Big Sugar. And with him, um, you know, he, he I believe he was in the Windsor area and he was a kid and Rush was coming to Detroit. And yeah. uh, these young kids, I don't know, they're nine. They somehow get across the border and you had to go and physically buy tickets in advance at the arena. So they had to go to a different country just to get tickets for a show that's coming up in a few months. So uh, Rush was a big, big influence on, on them and a lot of the other guests. Uh, at what point did vocals and songwriting come into play for you? So you, 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 play piano and keys, but you're also, uh, you have, you know, we're going to, we're going to dive into the moist stuff. And I think that the back of vocals in moist is, is like a huge part of the signature sound of the band and, and what made the band stand out. So we'll talk about that, but where does the vocals and songwriting come in for you? Uh, the songwriting, as I said, came in quite early. I mean, I, I heard a rush when you can do anything you want. There is no template. Uh, there, there are no rules. Um, and, and so I immediately started composing stuff when I was a kid. Um, it wasn't terribly good. Um, but, uh, and, and then when I discovered Alice Cooper, uh, listening to all those, and it was the later Alice Cooper stuff, this, some of the stuff he'd written with Bernie Taupin and worked a lot with Elton John, you know, that, that really, again, was kind of my gateway into, into songwriting. Singing was nothing I ever felt that I, uh, could do or, or or really wanted to do. Um, I, I, I felt more comfortable and still feel more comfortable behind something on stage, a keyboard, you know, what what have you. Um, but over time, it it when I was writing my own songs, it became something I I just started to work on. And the the amazing harmonies that you and Jeff do, and Jonathan as well for Moise, do does hearing and singing harmonies come easy to you or is that something you've had to work on over the years uh hearing and hearing and singing them i was fairly comfortable doing uh in in for lack of a better word in a vacuum uh hearing and singing them live uh took time um but uh but over the course of the years i've, I've become much better at it so when you think back to your childhood, what comes to mind? So I asked about earliest musical memories, I guess, when asking, you know, what comes to mind, just thinking about your childhood in general, outside of music, what, what comes to you when you think back to your childhood? Oh, there was a lot of church. Um, there was a lot of church. Um, and, and that was tied up in music for me because I, I also played, uh, my f folks are selfish, or we're selfish army officers and, uh, um, I played in the Salvation Army band. So I started in brass as well early on. Um, and there were, there was a lot of church. Um, but I also, there was a lot of, not high end, but there was a lot of travel. My folks traveled a lot. Um, I, I think when I look back, one of the things that really, I hated moving around as a kid but my parents had to be transferred to different places. I look that back now and I value that experience so much because I, I learned to sort of re, uh, reinvent myself, if I will, when I went to a new place, become, to be more open to the experiences that I could have. And that, that again, is something that stuck with me over the years uh, and, and become a patch. I feel like it would be tough as a kid to keep moving because you just, you know, you're, you're, just discovering who you are and you make friends and that's your world. And then you move and it's like, you got to restart again. Uh, you know, making new friends and, and building your own little community. So I guess that's the tough part is the starting over, but then the good part, like you just mentioned is every time you're starting over, you could be anyone, you can reinvent yourself. You, you know, if you didn't really like the way things were at the last place, you could be someone completely different uh, in, in a new place. I think one of the things I learned from that 
and I, I think it take, took a very long time to take hold, was that you, 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 you can't or you shouldn't let other people define you. Um, when I was a kid, and as I mentioned, I lived in Ottawa for a time, um, and I moved schools from one elementary school to another in Ottawa. I had a lot of friends, was, things were going great at the first school. The next school, I was the new kid for two years. I was bullied a lot. I was, uh, you know, I, I was this scrawny kid with glasses and I was, an, you know, an, a, a geek. So uh, I didn't, it's a, it was a terrible experience in a lot of ways, but I did learn from that experience not to let other people define who I was. So. So, so you grew up mostly in Ottawa and Kingston, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I grew up in Ottawa elementary school um, and then uh, moved to Kingston uh, uh, for grade six and, uh, and then stayed in Kingston to, uh, until, uh, until the end of high school. So Kingston has a lot of prisons. So when you mention your earliest memories of, of, uh, you know, being in, in, in the pen and your parents performing, I'm assuming that's the Kingston portion of your story. Absolutely. And I, we'd been in Kingston prior to Ottawa as well. So the, I, the, when I was, you know, barely able to remember, those are my, some of my earliest memories. Yeah. So when we schedule this interview, I put out the bat signal to Moist fans, seeing if they have any questions that they would like me to ask. And we have some questions sent in. And here's the first one. So this is from Vero Pocket, a nice good French name. Her question is, do you have any weird or funny stories about your time touring in Ottawa? And I don't know, maybe she doesn't know you actually lived in Ottawa. So just any Ottawa stories or I guess touring stories uh, being in Ottawa performing? Well, I, I, you know, I, I remember when in the early days, we'd go to Ottawa, the bars would close and we'd head to Hull. So, I mean, we basically embraced what a lot of people in Ottawa did uh, at the time. Um, yeah, I, so I have one. And I, again, I hesitate to bring this up. And I, it was late moist, I believe. Uh, and uh, my brother, who is nine years older than me, decided that he would try stage diving one night. And... Uh, now, I've been in the crowd. I admire him for this because I've been in the crowd and I don't like it. It's, it, it's, no, I'm not a stage diving guy. I love going to hardcore shows. I love watching people stage dive. I love catching them, moving them around, but I didn't want to be the guy in the air. And uh, yeah, I think, I think people just, by that point, stage diving was starting to trail off in moist shows a bit. And uh, let's just say that it, it, was, a, it was a rough landing. Oh man, I, uh, I I remember crowd surfing for the first time, and I learned my lesson on the very first one. Uh, for some reason, I had like a pocket full of tunies, and I decided it's the right time to, uh, you know, to crowd surf. And let's just say that right away, the 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 tunies, um, yeah, they all left my pocket. I, I that was a lot of money I lost back then. Yeah. You know, with inflation today, like I could have put a down payment on a house. So I don't know that I ever crowd surfed after that. Yeah, I've I've watched some some professional crowd surfers do it, and uh, one of my favorite memories being uh, Country Dick Montana from the Beat Farmers, uh, getting brought all the way back to the bar at the Commodore in Vancouver, and him yelling partway there and kind of summing up how I feel about being in the crowd. Him yelling, "Hey, let go of my boot! Somebody get this asshole off my boot!" So. That's funny. Uh, if I were to ask you as a kid what you want to be when you when you grew up, what would you say? I don't know at what point the musician dream kicks in, but as a kid, if I ask you what you want to be. Until the age of about five, I wanted to be uh, in the actual army. I don't know why. I don't recall. Um, but that was a, a short term thing. And, and after that, I, I wanted to be a musician. That was all I ever wanted to be. So while, while we're on the topic of Ottawa and Kingston, um, you, you have a story about playing at, at Carlton at, at Oliver's pub. Uh, do you want to share that story now? It was something it was in the winter. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, I, I do. Yeah. So, uh, so we did a lot of dubious traveling back in the day when Moist started out. And uh, uh, we had this, we had this van that 
occasionally broke down more often than occasionally. Um, and I, but I rarely felt fear about heading somewhere in a van. Uh, and I, but, but I specifically remember this one night we played Oliver's finished the gig. It's about what one, two in the morning and we're getting ready to drive straight to Thunder Bay. And I think we had to be, I think, I think the gig was the next day. So it's a 16 hour drop. So uh, it, it might've been the day after, I can't remember, but I was terrified and we had a discussion about it and, uh, uh, and we set off into the night. Um, and I don't know if it was that trip or another trip where we started discussing, uh, you know, everybody would sleep wherever they could in van. Some people would sleep, sleep on a hump. Some people would sleep on the base cabs in the back. Um, there were jokes about having to take us out of the van with a vacuum, uh, you know, things that you wouldn't think you'd want to spend a lot of time thinking about when you're touring, but we did. Uh, and it, it came right down to at one point, you know, so if we did get stuck somewhere, who would we eat first? Um, and, and, you know, and I'm happy to say that was Jeff, not me. So whoever has the most meat on their bones, I guess would go first. And whoever is most likely to put up or be overwhelmed in a concerted effort to, uh, you know, to make them dinner. I guess, I guess to move away from uh, cannibalism, we'll, we'll ask, uh, if I were to meet you at 12 years old, who would I be meeting? Who is Kevin at 12? I think you would have uh, been meeting a, a nervous kid. Um, you would have been meeting someone who was, who was very geeky, very into, like I say, comic books and science fiction and, and who spent, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, in my own kind of world, you know. Uh, I had friends, I had a lot of friends. But I, uh, but I, but I was an, I was a nervous kid. And when we're talking uh, science fiction, are we talking Star Wars, Star Trek, Dune? Wh what are you into? Star Wars, Star Trek, Dune, all of those. Uh, early on, uh, I read a lot of the, you know, the Isaac Asimov, Robert A. Heinlein, that sort of thing. That, that you know, that, that was when I was a kid. I was always looking for uh, books that. You know, I started reading the Foundation trilogy when I was by Asimov when I was probably about ten. Um, yeah, so all of that and more. You know, if you and I were friends at sixteen and you invited me over to your place to listen to music, what albums would you be spinning me at sixteen? Uh, okay. Uh, well, if I was, I probably wouldn't have been inviting you over to my place at sixteen. Um, just. I would have been spinning you Alice Cooper, the Beatles, uh, dare I say it, Ted Nugent, um, you know, a bunch of stuff of that ilk. Um, but uh, at 16 years old, I probably had my turntable with me, but I, my, my parents moved out on me uh, just before I was 15. They got transferred just before I was 16. They got transferred from, uh, from Kingston, to, to Barrie, Ontario, and I wasn't having anything of it. So, uh, so I stayed behind. When you say, dare I say it, Ted Nugent, is that because of all the political oh. incorrectness these days? Well, he's, just, he's just, you know, there was always the idea of the Motor City Madman. And, and uh, you know, Ted Nugent was a source of much amusement over time. Um, but it's become, it's become less amusing in, in the intervening years. Yeah, it's a little scary. You you can't deny the man's musical talent, but uh... no, and the and the 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 whole uh, the whole swinging from ropes on stage and loincloth. I mean, yeah, but you know, yeah, that's not to go too far into it. What what are some of the jobs that you had growing up before? becoming a professional musician and finding success with Moise. I, 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 the listeners like to hear that the musicians are, are humans with shitty jobs over the years and not just, you know, they pick up a guitar and they're a rock star and that's the end of the story. Uh, well, my first job was as a stock boy, uh, which was a learning experience and, and a pretty shitty job in a lot of ways. Um, 
but after my folks had moved, I needed to uh, make some money to sort of live. They, they helped me out, but um, uh, so I was working a stock boy through high school. I, I worked as, you know, in Vancouver, I worked as a, a, a bus boy, uh, bartender. I got promoted from bus boy to bartender at one restaurant, uh, which shortly thereafter went under. Um, but in, when I was going, when I was going to university and going to college, uh, in Kingston at Queens and then in Vancouver at, uh, Vancouver community college taking jazz, uh, I worked, I would go to the job boards and I would gather gardening jobs, digging out stuff, moving gravel, whatever, didn't matter. Uh, I just wanted to work for myself. Uh, and by having a whole bunch of these little gigs, uh, I, I was able to, you know, uh, not for, for a very long time, not have to work for an actual boss, except for people who that afternoon, I was hauling gravel into their backyard so they could do a patio or something like that. So there were a lot of shitty jobs in that experience, in that, in, in that because I'd do anything I could. Uh, one in particular was digging out a burned out kiln but I didn't, I didn't mind that. I never minded hard work. And having those, you know, kind of shitty jobs, do they make you appreciate the amazing career that you've had with music and, and writing? You know, there are times where I, you know, in the winter, I go out for a long walk and it's freezing and I see construction workers that are there all day long or they're digging ditches. And I think like not all jobs are made equal, like not all ways of making a, a living are equal here. Uh, no, I'm I'm very appreciative that 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 I've been able to uh, uh, make a living as a musician and 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 as a writer. Yeah. And how how early on did you know that you wanted to make a living as a musician and that this is actually something you could do if you if you stuck to it if you had a vision and you set your goals and and you developed your craft that someone might actually pay you for your talents. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know how much I thought about being paid for my talents. I think I just thought, I, I just looked at it and this is, you know, this is seventies, right? I grew up and I was a kid in the seventies. So it wasn't, we didn't have the instant access that we have now. We didn't have much music. We didn't see our heroes, our rock and roll heroes on, uh, you know, it was very rare. You'd see them on television shows occasionally, that sort of thing. I just knew, I just wanted to do that. I didn't know what the, uh, I didn't know how people got paid. I figured they got paid well, you know, I mean, but it, it really was, it was, it was, I just wanted to be playing music. I wanted to be working music in some capacity. Um, and hoped it was performing, but realized that I might end up doing something else in music entirely, but it would have been part of it, whatever I did. And what age did you start playing in bands? It's one thing to learn piano on your own, take lessons. At what point do you start playing with other people? At what age? Uh, so I was at probably 13 or 14 when I got thrown out of my first band. Um, uh, some friends and I formed a band and, uh, you know, the only thing that I had as a portable keyboard at the time uh, was a vintage pump or like antique pump organ that my, uh, my father had, uh, had given to me. Uh, so, uh, so that, that hit early on, but I, I played over the, over after that, I played in a, in a variety of different bands. Yeah. Our listeners love to hear the names of bands that musicians have been in before the band that they're known for. Uh, can you think, can you just rapid fire through band names? Uh, were there any ridiculous ones, any funny ones, any memorable ones? I wish I could remember that, that my first, my first actual band was a reggae band and I can't remember the name of it, but uh, <laughs> the other ones, uh, let's see, the Vanishing Waves. Um, oh, I'm spacing on it. The Groove Messiahs. Those That's a good name. Yeah, yeah. Both both uh, college bands for me. Okay, well, uh, I, I did my homework, and I have a quote here that involves the vanishing waves. Can you believe that? So I have uh, some kind words sent in here. 
from Jeff Pierce, bass player for Moist. And he mentions the vanishing waves right off the top. So here we go. This is a long one. He says, the first time I saw Kevin play was when his band Vanishing Waves faced off against Mark and my band VK Fan Club at a battle of the bands when we were all in second year at Queen's University in the mid 80s. His band won. And he was so cool, rocking his keyboard back and forth with wild and crazy hair. He was a punk. He, he was punk rock but played piano and organ. His band and my band all got to know each other and did lots of shows together. Ask him about our neighboring band houses in the Queens ghetto and how we experienced squalor firsthand. I wish I I had a chance to be in a band with him. Oh, wait, I did for 30 freaking years. Kevin is the secret weapon in Moist and the thing that set us apart from our contemporaries. But beyond his keyboards which were somewhat unusual for a 90s rock band, Kevin is just so musical. His taste ranges from DOA to Jackson Brown, and he's incorporated so many incredible musical ideas into the Moist catalog. Check out the way the keys interplay with the guitar and bass in Resurrection, or one of the beautiful solo piano pieces on each of our last four records to see how deep his musical mind can drill. Kevin is also one of my favorite people in the world. He knows how to get stuff done, but can also bring levity to stressful situations and creative solutions to any problems. He's a perfect bandmate, and he occasionally plays trumpet. So that's from Jeff Beers from Moist. Uh, that's very nice of Jeff to say, and I, uh, yeah, that's ve- it, it, it's very nice to hear people you worked with for that long still don't want to strangle you. After yeah. thirty years, he calls you the perfect bandmate. I mean, what what better feedback can you get? I gotta say, one of the thing, one of the advice, uh, one bit of advice that I give to, I have given over the years to young bands and anybody thinking of starting a band, is one of the most important decisions you will ever make are choosing who you're gonna, uh, choosing the people you're gonna work with. And we were very lucky and moist that the group of people that were together were very single minded in what we wanted to do. So. So let's let's just dive into the the beginning of Moist. Uh, how how did you meet the other band members, and where did the idea of starting a band together come from? So Dave, Dave and I met first. We met through friends. Uh, he and I he and I both uh, went to high school in Kingston. We went to different high schools in Kingston. Uh, but some of my buddies would uh, would rent student housing and and live there during the year um, for a while, and usually until they got evicted. So I met David at a party. Uh, at one of his houses and we were both pretty lit up and my memory of meeting David I've told this story often is standing on one side of a couch on a top of on the top of a couch having an argument with him about who was Spider-Man so uh, and like I said we were pretty lit up but uh, our first tour manager Stan also lived in that home uh, Jeff and Mark I met through uh, through Queens uh, through playing bands and 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 in the local Kingston scene, uh, and yes, we uh, we often have discussions about living in squalor. Uh, I think that I lived in the second worst student housing ever, the most squalor. With the except, there there's was Jeff and Mark. It was just exponentially worse. I, I, we never had our power cut off. I never had a snow drift in my living room. Yeah, you're going to have to take that up with Jeff. Yeah, they say uh, rock bottom is the perfect foundation to build a life upon. And that was you guys in uh, in Kingston. Yeah, yeah. So, so each individual musician might have their own influences. You were talking about for you, you loved Kiss, you loved uh, Rush, you loved Alice Cooper. When you put together a band that has four or five members, each member is bringing in those influences. Who would you say were the biggest influences on the band as a whole? So as you are getting together as Moist, you're figuring out your sound, who would you say the band's influences were? You know, that, that really is a, a tough question to answer, Joel, because because we were, we are, uh, we were all very single-minded, all very uh, vocal about what we liked and what direction we wanted to go. Um, there Obviously, early 90s, a lot of stuff going on that, uh, that had an influence on us, Pearl Jam, Nirvana being big ones. Um, but we all brought in our own influences. 
that were ranged so wildly that, that it's impossible to say this is what made the band sound like the band, you know? Um, it's just, it, we kind of had an idea of where we wanted to go, but finding our way through the various individual influences, I think is how we ended up where we ended up, if that makes sense. So you mentioned to me that before this interview, you went back and you you listened to the discography just to refresh on things. What what stood out to you when when now you know taking a step back and listening like it's a someone else's band listening? I believe there's five albums. What what stood out to you listening to the Moist discography? Uh, okay, so one of the, <laughs> I have not listened to End of the Ocean since we stopped recording it. Since I stopped having to listen to it. I'm not one of the, I, I don't listen to our music very often. I sometimes don't recognize that it's us right away. If I, wa- I walked into a room uh, with a guy that I do some training with and I said, is this moist? And he goes, yeah. And I said, can we please turn it off? You know, it's just, but uh, I, you know, one of the things was I was listening to End of the Ocean and I thought, you know, hey, this is, this is pretty good. Um, and uh, having listened to it on the heels of some of the earlier records, uh, it it did seem like a bit of a throwback in terms of the way that Mark, who produced the record, Mark McAway, wanted to capture kind of a bit of what we used to sound like. Uh, so that really stood out for me. And, you know, the thing that always surprises me if I happen to hear a moist tune is that, you know, hey, these guys are pretty good, you know, so... Yeah, I, I found that listening to End of the Ocean, that it was sonically closer to the first two albums versus the last two albums before end of the ocean. That was my takeaway. I would agree. I would agree. Um, so I've, you know, because of the Jeff interview, I listened to the discography multiple times. And then with this interview, again, I went back, listened to the discography multiple times. So what stands out to me uh, first is David's vocals. I mean, that's something unique that stands out right away. Uh, the bass to me stands out. It, it seems like the bass is very upfront in the mix on all the albums. And it's it's almost, you talked about Rush with Getty Lee, where the bass is is like the, the lead instrument, essentially, or, you know, the Chili Peppers, the bass is the lead instrument or Primus. Uh, a little more subtle, but I find that with Moist, the bass is actually one of the lead instruments and and the, the melody of the bass and the riffs uh, that that, to me stands out as some of the most memorable parts uh, of the songs when I listen to them. Uh, a few other things that stood out, uh, I've, I've mentioned to you that the back of vocals uh, between uh, you and Jeff, just such tasty back of vocals. And a lot of bands, yes, live, you have the singer and then other musicians singing backups. But a lot of times in the studio, they just get the lead singer to do his own backup vocals. So to me, it stood out on record that it was never David Usher doing his own backup vocals and that you guys were doing that. And the last thing that stood out was, uh, just like Jeff mentioned, that you on keys, you were like a secret weapon uh, for Moist because other bands in 94, 96, um, you had your Pearl Jams and your Nirvanas and your Sound Gardens and your Alice in Chains. And then there's this band that sounds in that universe, but this amazing keyboard playing, piano playing. And a lot of it had, there's like a classical vibe to it that somehow works with, with the heavy music. So uh, any, any responses to my takeaways from listening to the full discography? Yeah, I, you know, the, the keyboard thing is interesting because we did have people that would look at the band and go, ooh, what's that? what's that doing on stage? Uh, and I always used to joke that I was in the nineties, I was lucky to be on the stage instead of under it. Um, uh-huh. And obviously a lot of popular music at the time was guitar driven, but yeah, but a lot of the other alternative music that was around the time and pre that, you know, if you listen to Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, if you listen to the Ben Folds Five, uh, there, there was a lot of, just as a couple of examples, there were a lot of bands that were pushing the envelope in different ways. It's just that what happened to hit was more guitar based. Uh, as far as backing vocals, you know, Jeff, I can't say enough about Jeff as a musician. Um, he's, he's, he's an excellent songwriter. He's a wonderful lyricist. His, mel- his, his melodic sense on, on the bass as well as, uh, as, as well as on guitar, just in general. Um, but what really stands out, I really am sort of the second backing vocalist in Moist. 
in, in the early days. One of the signatures of our sound, I feel, has and how was and, and, and continues to be this urgent, just, I, I can't describe it. It's these urgent vocals, this tone Jeff has that no one else can quite cop. Uh, I can hit, you know, the same notes, but I will never have that tone in my voice. Mm. Yeah, I find that some of my favorite moments in moist songs is when those back of vocals come in and it's just there's something about it that to me it, it makes those songs you know the biggest to me a lot of the biggest hooks in the songs are those backups come in and it's just this warmth that comes over me you know like i am i am just content in this moment listening to this chorus it's something that we you know obviously as you from end of the ocean we'll get into this it's something that uh, we've expanded over time so yeah so let's let's dive into the uh, debut album. So 1994, Silver comes out. There's three singles. So you have Push, Silver, and Believe Me. So this was released independently first and yes. then re-released major label with EMI. Can you talk about um, just for people that aren't super familiar with how the business of music works, uh, why was it independent and then major label after that? The same album. It's not two different albums. How does that happen? So I, I'm going to go back just a little bit from there. Our first release was an independent tape, self-titled uh, cassette tape. Um, and uh, we had, some of that made it onto the record. Um, we sold that on tour well before we had, were signed to anything um, because we had convinced our agent at the time to get us out on tour. Um, through that, and through our management, Keith Marianovich, who was a buddy of the band's, uh, we connected with various labels and EMI Publishing, EMI April Music Publishing. We came to Toronto on one of our first tours, one of our early tours. We played a set and the entire music industry that had any interest in, in us went, yeah, don't feel it, except for EMI Publishing. So, we had by this point recorded, they had given us a little bit of money to record. We'd recorded more. Um, we released the album as a, as an independent release. Although if I, if I'm correct, I think when we released it, we had the publishing deal. Um, and, and then push take on, took off the music video. Uh, uh, there was interest from American labels. There was interest from, you know, various Canadian labels and, and we ultimately signed with with EMI, EMI uh, Music Canada. Okay, and they they see the success of Push with the music video, and they decide to just re-release what is already starting to take off with the independent album. Yeah, it was it was it was out there. It was ready to go. Um, we'd done a we'd done a pretty decent job of it. So uh, so there were there were no re-records. There was some slight tweaking to the art, but it is essentially the same album. The and first one on EMI records, of which there are only a few of, maybe 2,000 of them, maybe less, uh, has, has the name of the record spelled incorrectly. I believe it's called Sivir. So not even Sliver. But it's it's not Sliver. even Sliver. You know, but but uh, EMI, EMI signing us, we had a lot of interest from the US, but EMI Canada signing us was, was critical. EMI yeah. publicly signing us was critical as well so and what what thoughts memories uh emotions come back to you when you think back to this debut album i mean that kick-started the entire last 30-year journey that you've had in the music industry I, I mean, there's so much i mean there's moments on tour there's moments in the studio um you know we <laughs> i remember walking out of my parents house in toronto because they were in toronto i was in vancouver and walking into my parents' house after visiting them, literally having almost a garbage bag full of sandwiches for the band. Uh, we lived on $10 a day on, for a number of our first tours. So Subway and, uh, and the Subway uh, sandwich uh, loyalty card were our friends. Um, yeah, I mean, not having a lot of money, but, but having a lot of uh, having this, this new family that you spend time with, even though we were all friends and had been friends for, for quite a while. Um, it was, it, it was an 
it was starting a new family. And, and push and silver. I mean, those are such, those are two great singles to introduce the band to the world. When you were done recording that album and you had the songs push and silver, did you think, man, I really think that, that these two songs could take off. I think we really knew we had something with push. Um, but just because we had something that we felt was really strong doesn't mean that it was going to be, uh, that other people were going to resonate with it. Uh, both push and silver, those, those, there's an anthemic feel to them and that they just, they just go together really well. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I can't think of a, a better, uh, we're lucky to have those songs. Yeah, it, it's like the ultimate one-two punch for a band on their debut album to to break open the doors. I found. Yeah, believe me was a different story because believe once we release believe me because we're always about we want to be heavy we want to be harder we want to be yeah and uh, believe me was uh, was tougher for us because it's it it, it was softer obviously um, we actually tried to rework it for live. And I remember we played it at CBGB's in New York for our then US label rep. And we, we did this terrible version of Believe Me in an effort to make it a little heavier. And it was absolute silence from our rep. And I remember David looking at me and going, I don't wanna go back there and talk to her. Do you? No, so yeah. Was there a fear of releasing a single like Believe Me that was uh, you know softer than the first two singles? I think there was, and, and it was also, but I mean, we were a rolling business meeting. We were constantly trying, you know, second guessing and, and, and navel gazing about what was the best way, what was the consensus, what was the best way to go forward. Like I say, uh, going back to um, choose your bandmates wisely, we were so committed. We just, we didn't want to screw up. Yeah. That, that album comes out, goes four times platinum. I mean, Almost no human being will know that level of success with an album. Can you try to put into words what your life was like at the, the peak of that album? You know, I think at the peak of that album, it was, it, it was, it was wonderful. Like it was great. It was, it was wonderful to be playing larger and larger stages and, and, uh, and traveling all over Canada and, and, you know, uh, traveling elsewhere, traveling in going to Britain, going, uh, you know, it, it was wonderful, but it was really for us kind of one foot in front of the other. We toured constantly. Um, we didn't have apartments. Uh, I remember renting an apartment for a month when we got a month off tour in Vancouver, living with our road manager. Uh, you know, I had a piece of foam on the floor and we had a toaster oven. We didn't even have a television. The necessities. Know? Yeah, it was like, you know, we're going to be out of here in a month. So I, I remember it as, you know, slightly... Uh, it was kind of a level of squalor in the van and in the constant touring that uh, that that uh, maybe our, our our band has is when we were students prepared us for. And was it overwhelming to have so much success at such a, such a young age or did you feel like you were ready for it? Um, I don't I can't say it felt overwhelming. I think everybody felt differently about it. Um, you know, I imagine it was more overwhelming for, for David because being the face of the band, um, he, he's going to experience a lot of good things, but a lot of negative elements to that as well. The, you know, the, the suddenly not having as much privacy, not having, uh, you know, being constantly recognized, that sort of thing. But it was, we loved it. It wasn't a matter of, are we ready for this? Are we going to, you know, it was just, this is what we want to do. Like, what happens next? What do we do next? Hey, Keith, what do we do next? Right? Yeah, yeah, what's we, on the schedule today? What's, yeah. What do we do? Like we had to, we had to finally, with Silver, we had to put a pin in the balloon and say, we cannot tour anymore. We actually have to go back and make our second record. Is it true that, silver costs like four thousand dollars canadian because you guys recorded it yourselves before it got picked up by a major label probably not um you know i'm sure that it uh it, it didn't cost much uh in terms of what we actually laid out as a band to record it yeah it could have been about four grand um 
I mean, the, the making the record, the bones of the record, that's fairly accurate, actually. Because we would sneak into 8th Avenue Sound at night, record, get out, go back in whenever we could. I mean, we, we didn't have any money, you know. Back, back in the mid-90s, where labels were making more money than ever, the budgets they had for albums were insane. So... I, I think that if the album cost you guys, let's say $4,000 and it went four times platinum, that might be the most financially successful Canadian album of all time. What do you think? I have no idea. I have no idea. There were a lot of albums that, uh, that did, uh, uh, you know, sold a lot of records. Uh, it's quite possible. But they might have cost $400,000 to make, right? So they, even though they might have gone six times platinum, they didn't get you know, as many times a return on investment. But when you start factoring it, sort of, this is the, this is the jaded guy who's been in the industry for a long, when you start factoring it, factoring in all the marketing money that went into making videos and all the marketing to drag the band around and do, you know, and David, we stopped mid tour, David had appendicitis, he was out of the game. They sent the rest of the band around to talk to radio stations, all that travel, all that tour support, um, you know, Making an album uh, success is far more is about far more than spending the money on it. You know, some of my favorite records are records that were made on a shoestring. I remember Hayden's "Everything I Long For." Love Hayden. That record was made on what a four track, and you know that uh, it, it. What goes into a record is so much more than. I, you know, I hate to say it, than just the recording. Yeah, I, I think the low budget Hayden album, that, that's a part of what made it so endearing with the style of music. Absolutely. And, and just the, the songs. Again, it comes, down, it comes down to songs. It always comes down to the songs. You can spend a ton of money. And if you don't have the songs, it's not going to help you in the least. I think Facebook knows I'm a Hayden fan because I keep getting targeted. I think he just released a new album or he's about to release one. So Facebook's letting me know I, I need to check that out. Yeah, yeah. I think Facebook's right on that. Uh, wrong on so many other things, but right in so on that. So the this debut album going four times platinum, it's still to this day the band's most successful album. Do you think that a band having their debut album be the band's most successful album, does that mess with a band over time? I think every band approaching their second record wants to avoid the sophomore jinx, as it's called. Uh, that was something that was, you know, top of mind for us when we were making the second record. Um, and, and then I think at some point reality sets in and you go, you know, it's going to sell what it sells and we're going to do what we do. And if it's not as popular as it once was, or we're not as popular as we once were, or we make a record that tanks, you know, that's, yeah, that's kind of the gig you signed up for. Um, do you worry about it? Yeah. But aside from, you know, doing your best to talk what you do, there's, there's very little, you, can, you can't control what people are going to think of your records, you know? All you can do is make the best album possible, make an album you know that you love, and then it's essentially out of your control what happens afterwards. Absolutely. And and as it should be. Yeah, it's it, it's it's such a strange industry where despite your talent, despite recording an amazing album with incredible songs, there's a level of luck that goes with it, depending on how the label actually markets, what the, um, you know, what, what the, I guess what the fans are like, what, you know, what's currently trending, that kind of stuff. You hear albums all the time, like uh, Maroon 5's debut album came out, did nothing forever, and then goes on to sell like 10 million copies like a year or two later. Kid Rock is on his like fifth album uh, uh what is it devil without a cause that comes out does nothing for like a year and then he just had one video where he's with a bunch of women on the beach like he played a live concert that went viral and suddenly it goes on to sell 25 million copies yeah and and now he's on 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 uh, the internet shooting up bud light cases what he's, he's joining the ted nugent crew i think yes. is what's going on 
Yeah, that's too funny. Uh, wh what was it like hearing your music for the first time on the radio? So I, I don't know if it was push around that time or if you had some independent mm -hmm. airplay before that. It would have been something from um, from our 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 our, our EP, uh, probably on Coast 1040 in in Vancouver. Um, I have a memory of hearing Sea Touch Feel, which is a song that was never on any of our official records, but was on our, our original demo tape. Um, hearing that on Coast and, and thinking that was really cool. I also have a visceral memory of hearing Breathe for the first time in a cab with a good friend of mine uh, who then gave me a dressing down because she didn't think it was uh, a rockin' enough release. <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, it, it's a thrill. It's always a thrill. I mean, hey, we're on the radio. You know, I mean, it was it was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So the song Push to this day is still the band's most popular song, at least on Spotify, is 2.6 million spins. Why do you think people love Push so much? You mentioned that there is this anthemic thing going on with it. Why else do you think people love that song? You know, I think one of the things that comes across with that song, David's a fantastic performer and his, and his performance on that song, nailing that in the studio, the, the energy, the urgency, you know, uh, it's hooky. And Mark's guitar is... That riff. That riff is... Mark has this brilliant way of writing solos and he, he can rip it up in a, in, a, in a huge way when he wants to. But his solos, like Jeff's bass playing, uh, very melodic, very singable. And so I think, I think it, it was kind of a one, two punch with that one song, you know, uh, and it, at the heart, like I say, we kind of knew we had something special when we first heard punch. So over, over the last 30 years, Moise has made a ton of music videos. Do you think that the original, the push music video is the most important music video in Moise career? Uh, rumor has it, it was made for like three thousand uh, dollars. Jeff Jeff talked about you just knew people that had cameras, and you ended up getting a warehouse. Like it's all very random stuff. So we, it's it's made for yeah. so cheap, and it goes on to you know number one on Much Music. It wins the band its first Juno uh, for best video, I believe. Is this the most important music video in your career? I don't think we got a Juno for that video. Um, we might have, we probably got some kind of much music award and the MMVA for it. Uh, yes, absolutely. The most important video we ever made because it was the first and it was what sold the band. Uh, we had met these people from a production company because, and Jeff has told this story, we played a, a party for them and they brought out the whole crew to film this video. Uh, so yes, it was absolutely important. What was also really important is that EMI Publishing and their then uh, radio promoter, independent promoter, Bobby Gale, who has since passed away tragically, Bobby brought that into Much Music and basically wouldn't leave until they watched it. So well, it was, I think it was a great video. I think David and Mark's performance, particularly great performances, uh, but it was the whole team behind us. It was the people that were willing to do anything for us, including our management, uh, that, that made that. There was a lot of luck, but there was a lot of work behind the scenes. God bless them. So, so I, I have to bring this up because this happened during the Jeff interview as well. So um, the song Push at the 1995 Juno Awards was nominated for Best Video and for Single of the Year. And Jeff corrected me as well. Same thing as you, where he said, well, I don't think we won for best video. Um, in my research on, on uh, Wikipedia, it, it says that you guys won for best video and Jeff corrected me. And I'm like, oh, okay. I got to, you know, watch out for that. And then again, I, 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 this is from Wikipedia again, and you corrected me. So we need to figure out either Moise doesn't remember that they won or Wikipedia is, is wrong with this one. Internet lies. Never. And, Fake and news. Think about our Wikipedia page very often. So it's, you know, it got put up there and yeah. So maybe, uh, maybe someone who's a freelance writer should go through that and, uh, you know, fix it. Okay. But the, the band has won two Junos yes. off, off of like six or eight nominations, something like that. Yeah, we won uh, best new band. Uh, and, and gasoline. 
gasoline and, for single or something? No, I th- for some reason, I want to say it was uh, tangerine, but I, I really don't recall. Uh, so gasoline wins in 97 for best video. So unless that is incorrect as well, which you know, I'm just making up stats here. Just go with it. You got them here? I've got the Junos at the top of my bookcase here. And I have, oh, Jesus, my old eyes can barely read this. Best new group. And then gasoline. (sighs) Gasoline. All right. So, yeah, there's no. So there we go. Yeah. So it's uh, now we know. So it's best new group that I don't see anywhere on Wikipedia. That's the one that's missing. And then they do say uh, gasoline. So now I know. So I don't have to say that incorrectly moving forward. You used to call the best new group the kiss of death award. Uh, but clearly it's not. And given if you see some of the artists who've received it since it's launched a lot of careers, it's helped launch a lot of careers. So as we wrap up talking about the debut album, so that came out in 1994, which means that next year is the 30 year anniversary. Uh, I know you had a 25 year anniversary. Uh, you guys went out on tour. Uh, anything for the 30 year anniversary? Anything planned? What do you think? No plans right now. No okay. plans for the 30 year anniversary. Although, uh, there have been some discussions about what to do about the belated 25th anniversary of Creature. So honestly, I, I have no idea what we're going to do next. No worries. Uh, we have a fan question. This is from Elizabeth Moon. I'd love to ask Kevin what his favorite Halloween costume of all time has been. Ah. As I know, he loves Halloween, and I'm sure he's dressed up in some extravagant costumes. Elizabeth Moon. Okay. Demon priest with a snake through my body was pretty good. Couldn't get the makeup off afterwards, though. Uh, I think my favorite Halloween costume of all time, I dressed up as Alice Cooper when I was in high school. And I, if I do say so myself, it, it was pretty faithful. I'll have, to, I'll, have to, I'll have to post the photo to my, to my Instagram. That's awesome. I remember one year I had a girlfriend that put uh, eyeliner on me as a part of my Halloween costume. I had never put eyeliner on. So I didn't know that, you know, Halloween's done. I go to bed. I assume it just comes off. I didn't know you need makeup remover. So the next day, I think I was at the dentist with with the uh, the eyeliner still on. I couldn't get it off. So that was that was a, a fun morning. I know we're I know we're taking time talking about stuff and I don't want to go off piece too much. But the first time I saw the Rocky Horror Picture Show, I let a friend and I let uh, a couple people in line do kind of a domino face, a one side, a Harlequin kind of thing, you know, one side black, one side silver or white. Um, and this friend and I at about, you know, four in the morning when we got home, we're both in our individual bathrooms going, it won't come off. It won't come off. So that's no. amazing. That's amazing. Next album, 1996, you guys released Creature. There's four singles, Leave It Alone, Resurrection, Tangerine, and Gasoline. Debuts at number seven. This is a top 10 album, three times platinum. And I have to share a story. So the first thing is you can see the album cover here. Uh, so this is my my wall of fame. These are my 12 favorite albums from guests that I've had on the podcast. So going back to the Jeff episode, I got that album up. And This album is actually one of the most important albums in my musical history because I was just 11 years old when this album comes out. And I remember I had a CD Walkman and I owned just two albums. I had Moist Creature and I had Bush Razorblade Suitcase, which I believe both albums came out in 1996. And I would be on tour buses for hockey going to tournaments. And I just had the two albums that I would go through one after the other. And this album, it just felt important. There was like an epicness to it, uh, something about the sound. It just, it just felt important, and it felt like I was, I was a part of history. So I wanted to share that with you. The how far back I go with this album. That's wonderful to hear. That's the kind of impact on people that it's so always a pleasure to hear. Yeah, I always thought. Uh, so up here, I have "Stain Break the Cycle." So I was sixteen when that came out, and that was. You know, one of the first albums that I purchased with my own money that I loved, I felt like the lyrics and the singer, uh, Aaron Lewis, that they were singing to me. So just with, you know, our memories 
they're not all accurate. And I, I always thought kind of the first album I really got into was that one. And it was only when going back to uh, listen to Creature for the Jeff episode that I realized that, you know, the Creature album I loved and it predated that one by, by about, uh, you know, four or five years. So I go way back. Way it, back with creature here. It's, it, it was a, uh, yeah, that was a, uh, that was it. That was an interesting record to make. Very different from our first, obviously. You know, uh, it was our first, really, our first major label record uh, with a major label budget. I was going to say, you can hear, um, I believe there's a huge step up in sonic quality on that album from the first album. And is that because of the budget? There was more money for better studio, better equipment engineers and producers mixing mastering all that stuff and so we worked with paul northfield on that record and uh, paul uh as an engineer and as a producer his work i mean paul worked with rush paul's worked with oh i can't even begin to uh list the number of bands important bands he's worked with um so yeah we recorded a good chunk of creature at Morn heights the studio in Morn heights before it was closed uh, we got our drums up there. We did some ac uh, acoustic piano up there and then went into, by this time we're in Montreal, into a little uh, studio in on the plateau. But yeah, it, we had more money to do it, but we also had, um, we had a guy with us that had made a lot of records before. And, you know, the band had been playing now for several years, touring relentlessly. We were a lot tighter, a lot sure of what, a lot more sure of what we wanted to achieve. So in, in my opinion, uh, I believe it's the band's best album. Is that the universal consensus that you hear from Moise fans or the favorite albums are all over the place? I have no idea. Most people's favorite albums are either Silver or Creature. Uh, although I have pe heard people say, you know, my favorite record is Mercedes. Uh, but but it, those first two records were the ones that, that really, really hit home with people. So the first single, Leave It Alone, is still to this day the band's highest charting single. They, it, it charted at, at number three. What's that? No idea. No idea. There you go. Uh, well, I, I'm just spinning some facts for, for, the, for the fans here that don't know. And uh, Resurrection. So I was able to find uh, a review from Billboard uh, for this, the single Resurrection, which to me, that was my favorite song off a of creature back when I was 11. I remember rocking that song pretty hard. Uh, so Billboard reviewed the song favorably, calling it a killer slice of pop injected angst. And as lyrically intelligent as it is sonically striking, I thought you would enjoy that review. It, it, it's it's lovely. Uh, it's I, I don't recall reading that review, but I tend to rem remember the uh, the uh, brutal reviews more than I remember the good reviews. But that's you know it's a lovely thing to say. I had uh, I had the the original drummer from Papa Roach on the podcast, and when I shared a few nice reviews with him, he said the exact same thing. He's like, "Man, where were you with those reviews back when they released them?" Because all I remember is them calling us a horrible band, and this is a terrible album. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it's it's you remember the bad reviews, but the, the bad reviews all also really motivate you. You know, yeah, I've I've heard it takes I think ten compliments to negate just one. Uh, you know, something negative that's been said. That's the way the brain works is you need 10 positives to offset one negative. And I think it's a survival mechanism that something negative could be life or death. So that's why you you zone in on it and you remember it. I, I, I also remember some of the negative reviews being very well written. Uh, and <laughs> they took their time with those. No, I, one of the first reviews from Tron, I, 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 I used to remember it verbatim, but I do remember it, it being, it, them saying something like, uh, remember that episode of Family Ties where Mall Mallory goes to the home Strawberry Bowl homecoming dance and there's a band playing? Well, this is that band. And uh, we, that was a review of us live at Lee's Palace in Toronto. Oh, man. So, so Resurrection, great single, super popular, one of my favorites. You actually have a story that we almost had an album, we almost had a Creature album without that song. Is that correct? Well, no, you didn't almost, uh, you, uh, because we, uh, we, the second record was tough to write. We went into, we had moved to Montreal uh, and we had this, uh, in this rehearsal space in uh, at 1400 Saint Laurent, 
and and we would work in there, write in there, record on a four track. And we had gotten to the point where we thought, okay, we're done. We've written the record. We, we, we think we've got everything we need. And we brought it to EMI and they said, we think you need to go back in and write a bit more. And of course, our response was, you know, what, we know what we're doing. We went back in and resurrection came out of those next sessions. I can't remember what else came out of those sessions, but resurrection, uh, arguably one of our most important songs came out of those sessions. And it, you know, this is something I brought up with the guys from the label when I run into them. Uh, and they brought up with me, um, they said, you know, I remember we pushed you guys pretty hard. I hope there's no bad feelings about it. And I always tell that story back to them and I, I explain, you know, in retrospect, we could have gone and put that record out and maybe it would have been great, but we wouldn't have had resurrection. And that was a really, really important to luck. Yeah. To me, that was the song. Like when I, when I think of creature, I think of resurrection. So it was important. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you're not you're in, in a band. There's always the danger of, of believing that not believe and not necessarily fully believing your own hype, but getting to a point where you really feel, Hey, we did this on our own the first time. And, and, and so I think we know what we're doing. Uh, but all those other ears, all those other people that listen and comment and have been working in the industry for years, they're really important. They're really formative. Even if you don't always see eye to eye, you don't learn anything unless you listen to people that you may disagree with. And that's in music and in life. So on this rock record, we have trumpet on creature. We have cello on tangerine. We have you on piano across the album. I mean, who do you guys think you are with these instruments on a rock record? A lot of rock records had trumpet. A lot of records had piano. I, I recall a very famous band from the seventies with a lead singer who played flute. Um, you know, there are no rules. Uh, and I think, I think at that point, we just wanted to expand sonically a little bit. And those were, you know, really in retrospect, super tiny baby steps, but they, 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 they paved the way, I think, going forward for us a bit. And also we were so lucky to have such great, uh, musicians play with us on that record. So I want to show the the longevity and the legs that this album had. So it comes out in 96 and then it's at the 97 Juno Awards where you guys win best video for gasoline. And then at the next year at the 1998 Juno Awards, the album's nominated for album of the year and rock album of the year. So this is over a two year period. It's still uh, getting nominations. Getting What's that? Are you getting this from Wikipedia? This is this is from Wikipedia, man. It could be. I, I can't. But yes, it did have a lot of legs. It went on. Creature went on for a long time. Um, Creature, we, we often we often brought up the fact that uh, the last single, if I recall, we released from released from Creature was Gasoline, uh, which had a lot to do with its longevity. But by the time we released Gasoline, we were we were done personally with that record. We the band did not want to tour anymore. The band wanted to go back and start our next. We wanted to start our next record. Uh, our management company we were then managed by Network Records or by Network Management. Uh, our management company suggested we hang a tour around Gasoline, do theaters, and do kind of an in, an acoustic tour, which for us meant occasionally sitting down and hauling in an acoustic guitar. Uh, so. I, we often joked about the fact it was the um, the single we did. Gasoline was the single we didn't want to release, and ended up leading to the tour we didn't intend to do. We were so again another one of those situations where we were incredibly lucky that uh, that other people in the industry said we think there's more legs here. Let's see what you guys can do with this. So I have, I have a silly question that you can answer or not answer. Uh, what did you spend your first major paycheck on? So major could be anything to you that was more significant than any other paycheck. Uh, I asked this because I've heard other people do interviews and they get really funny answers from, you know, Corey Taylor from Slipknot spent, I don't know, $15,000 on like 
ice cream. Like there's been some ridiculous things. So just curious if, if anything comes to you for that question. So the interesting thing about Moist is that uh, we didn't really get any big paychecks. Uh, we parceled the money out and this was, this was again, something that uh, we, we paid ourselves a certain amount of money as you, like a real job. Uh, and nobody got tons and tons of money except, you know, songwriting royalties coming in. So a lot of money, early days, silver went right back into the band. Uh, and then with Creature, it's like save your money, keep it, keep it going over time. So I didn't get a really giant paycheck and spend a money on, on something. You know, I, I grew up pretty frugally too. So, I mean, uh, aside from the, 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 the sickness, as I call it, the deer sickness of wanting to buy new gear, um, you know, that would, that would be what I would spend my money on. So but at least it, that's like a reinvestment into your career. You know, that's of all the things you could spend your money on. That's a good one. Absolutely. It's like more, more gear. So I have some some kind words sent in here, and this is not from a Moyes band member. Uh, this is from uh, Jerry Finn. So uh, for Killer Dwarfs, Brian Byrne, Burton Cummings, and uh, he was a part of the crew with, with David Usher. Uh, this is what uh, Jerry Finn says. I've been a fan of Kevin's and the band Moist for as long as I can remember. In fact, my parents would bring me to see them when I when I was just a child. So I know that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> uh, many years later, I was fortunate enough to play with Kev. In my opinion, he is a unique and powerful voice. The character that he added to Moist and David's solo work, as well as the music that we made together with Brian Byrne, is as distinctive as anything I've ever heard and loved. I know it's I know it's him after hearing just two notes. I can't wait to play with him again. Viva La Kev. Uh, that's from Jerry Finn. Jerry fucking Finn. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, Jerry, I love Jerry. I don't know why he tried to cut my arm off one day, but, or, or, or break it in a, in a, in the, our first David tour with, with Jerry. Uh, I was uh, standing outside of the bus with my arm hanging inside the bus and he closed the door on my arm. Now, we always bring this up as a uh, as something that wasn't intentional, but I knew he was out for out for blood. I knew. He, no, I I love Jer, and we've had, as he said, we've had the opportunity to play together. Uh, we did uh, some some playing together uh, with Brian Byrne um, in Brian's country band, uh, which uh, honestly ha is, remains a show in Newfoundland. I did at Marble Mountain with Jerry and with Bruce Gordon from IME and with uh, a bunch of other very fine, talented musicians in Brian's band, one of my all-time favorite gigs. So in 1999, you guys released Mercedes Five and Dime. Uh, two singles, Breathe and Underground, debuts at number seven. So another top 10 album goes platinum. So the, there's a two-year gap between the first two albums and then a three-year gap between Creature and this one. Is that because of the longevity uh, of, of Creature? touring behind it this there's all these singles yeah there was a, partly i think it was the longevity of that and it, I, and again uh, at the time that mercedes and i believe jeff talked about this at the time that mercedes was this was our second record with network as management um at that point in time technology was starting to change we did a lot of recording early on demoing of that, of Mercedes Five and Dime in early uh, digital audio workstation software. We used, uh, what we use? I guess Cubase a lot. So, um, so yeah, it, it, it took time, but I, I think, I think he had it on, on the nail on the head that we'd been working on Creature. We'd been working Creature for so long that it took us time to regroup. <clears throat> So when I when I listen back to Mercedes Five and Dime, it it has, I, I would call it a more mature sound than the first whatever mature means. Like if there's a progression in the sound of the band, and um, you know, a little less heavy. And I found you know there's kind of electronic undertones uh, between production choices, but also between you know, program drums that are on there. Was that a conscious choice going into the recording of the album that we are going to expand our sound or it's just something that kind of happened while you were writing? I think part of it was uh, uh, just, just that it happened while we were writing. Typically before that, writing was all of us in the room, all, to, all together, 
uh, you know, people would bring in ideas, either fully written songs or, or partially written, uh, and then we'd hammer them out. Uh, live recording, listening to it back, you know, time honored process. Um, when we started with with using uh, using some of the newer tools at the time, uh, things were done more separately, and so that allowed everybody was able to kind of expand their voice a little bit, if if you will. Um, and I, I think that that separate but together process uh, was was part of what made that record more wide ranging sonically. But but we were also working with a producer who was willing to let us in the studio when we were recording that in Piccolo Studios in Montreal, uh, go wild a bit. Um, you know, the chains of effects that we were using for keyboards, for example, um, you know, we didn't, we couldn't, we didn't meet a song. We didn't try, you know, taking the Hammond B3, running that through the Leslie, running, running, uh, running another keyboard through the Leslie, running it through a pedal, doing this. It was, it was a crazy creative record for us. So through the first three albums, the band has gone eight times platinum. Do you feel after this album that you can do no wrong? Like no matter what you release is going to go at least platinum or multi-platinum? No, no. I mean, obviously since uh, uh, Mercedes didn't uh, do as well as the other albums, you can kind of see the writing on the wall that, uh, that you're, you're not, uh, the freshest face anymore. Uh, and also once, uh, once, once the two thousands hit, once Napster hit, once all of that hit the record industry changed, um, completely. So what, uh, what would you say is your, your favorite part of the songwriting process? Is it getting the original idea for a new song? Is it, you know, f fleshing it out? Is it jamming with other musicians? Is it, recording it is it when it's released and now there's something where before you that that didn't exist like you've created something from nothing what what is your favorite part it depends from song to song i mean it's all of the above it can be that initial feeling when you when you put something together in the studio or in the rehearsal studio where you ah, this is great this is fantastic best song ever you may not feel that way the next day but th so there's that um, or when someone brings in a song either fully formed or partially formed that you think is just wonderful and you can't wait to dig into it. One of, one of the things that I really love is when you sit down to actually record. And if you don't know exactly what you're going to do, sometimes the craziest and most beautiful things come out. Uh, Underground for Mercedes, um, Jeff had had done this recording that we ultimately replaced with real strings on with these MIDI strings. I then did this big synth intro that I'd recorded in my little home studio uh, in in Cubase, um, and then we we brought it into the studio. And I remember going recording that song in Morn Heights with David Leonard, our producer, and I had this original Nord lead synthesizer that, I, that one of the first ones that, that came out and he said so what are you planning on and i said let the track run and uh, i'll show you and so we let the track run and i had this bubbly sound and i started playing it and he goes oh that's really cool let's lay that down and i went you didn't record that he goes no and i said oh record everything i have no idea what i just did you know so those moments where something just drops out of the heavens whether it's a full song or whether it's just a little tasty bit, those are, that's my favorite. Do you have an, an app or a hard drive where you've just recorded all these different ideas, whether it's song ideas or keyboard riffs or. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have multiple uh, drives. I have uh, my phone has a ton of, uh, a ton of little bits and pieces on it. Uh, when touring when, often when we were touring we we'd start laying down something in a sound check uh, and and you know you're looking for david's taping it or i'm taping it or someone's taping it so that we can go back to it later so there's tons tons out there so you just mentioned touring you have a story that involves bands like whole green day metallica do you want to share that story with uh, with our listeners something about you and some family members and courtney love yeah, so there, there are those are multiple stories but uh, i'll give you i'll give you one my my mother is one of the sweetest 
women you'll ever meet. Um, we were playing edge fest and hole was on the bill and my brother was walking my mom through catering through the artist tent where everybody was eating and my mother in a very loud voice said to my brother i didn't happen to be there said to my brother she looked over saw courtney love and quite loudly said is that the mouthy one and my brother bundled her along. So, you know, there could have, you know, maybe my mother and Courtney could have gone toe to toe. I don't know. I think I think Courtney probably would have taken it as uh, an older woman expressing her. Uh, her I don't know. Cor- Courtney's known. She might have been down for a brawl. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know which Courtney you'd get that day. Yeah, I, I, you know, I suppose. I suppose. But yeah, I mean, we had a chance to meet a lot of uh, a lot of people. The folks from Hole were lovely. Uh, Green Day. I have a great story about Green Day. We played uh, Cleveland and we were playing this outdoor venue. Green Day was on last. And I remember leaving, saying goodbye to Tom Wilson from Junkhouse and saying, hey buddy, have a good day. And getting the hell out of Dodge because Green Day had a tendency to cause uh, small riots. And that day was no exception. So uh, I heard about it from Tom later. So, uh, Mercedes, the album, this is the band's last studio album for for a, a 12 year plus period. There was a hiatus there. And during that time, so David Usher is releasing solo albums. You were a part of the solo albums as well, right? Uh, between the, the writing and recording and also a part of the touring band. Is that correct? Touring. Um, I mean, we we have, to, you know, we would get together and write. But I mean, the David solo stuff is is very much David. And uh, and, you know, <laughs> Uh, I was, Jeff and I were, were both blessed to play with that. Uh, it's actually the second iteration of his, uh, of his, of his solo band, but the first touring iteration, uh, John was actually in the very first iteration after little songs. Uh, we only played a couple of gigs on, on that record. Um, but yeah, we, and I, I toured, I've toured with them, uh, throughout that entire time period and, and hope to do more David shows in the future. Yeah, I, I love that because normally when a, say, a singer from a band goes out and does a solo project, it's like he wants to get the hell away from the band that he was in, you yeah. know? So it's like new musicians, new producers that he works with. And I love that in his case, it's like he brought everyone along um, and it showed the relationship that you guys had. So I thought that was actually pretty endearing. You know, David and I are- have been friends since high school and are, are very close and he's very close to the band and he did expand. He, so he worked with a lot of different people. He's worked with a lot of different musicians over, over time. Um, but he also, you know, he values friendships, he values loyalty and he values working relationships that work. Um, he worked very closely with, uh, with Paul Northfield on his first solo record who had done Creature and this was recorded after Creature. And, uh, you know, another, a record that I absolutely love, uh, Little Songs. Um, you know, David, David values loyalty, but also, as I say, relationships that are creative and, 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 and based on something beyond maybe this will work. Yeah, his uh, his output with his solo stuff is pretty impressive. I mean, there's more David Usher solo albums than there are Moist albums, Absolutely. right? Like quite a bit more, I think. Absolutely. And and uh, often programming uh, keys for David shows has sometimes been a lot more challenging than uh, uh, programming some of the, well, definitely the early Moist stuff, but, you know. What do you think makes David Usher such a great front man? Um, he sticks the landing every time. Let's put it that way. He sticks the landing every time. He sticks it in the studio and he sticks it on stage. He brings the same level of passion and power um, to the stage that he he brings to record. It's very faithful. And, you know, just really at the heart of it, he's just an excellent, he's a, he's a wonderful singer, but he's an excellent frontman. He's He's got that, you know, th- that X factor, that charisma. Quality. That charisma that, uh, that, you know, for looking back at the bands I've played with over time, 
I've always wanted to be in a really good live band. And we always felt with Moist that it was a very good live band. And a lot of that was hung on David. And, and same as David's solo record. People would come to see David, David's solo band play and they didn't expect the show they got because they didn't, you know, they might think, oh, it might not rock as much or it might not, you know. I mean, he's just a phenomenal performer. So in 2014, you guys released Glory Under Dangerous Skies. So two singles, Mechanical, Black Roses. The album debuts at number three, and uh, it had legs as well. Spent 22 weeks on the charts. Black Roses was a top 10 hit. That also spent 20 plus weeks on the charts. My question is, how good did it feel to have a new Moist album uh, after 15 years since the Mercedes album? Pretty goddamn good. Uh, but if you had said to me when we first got back together for that, uh, for the, I think it was 2013 Resurrection Tour, if you had said that we would be releasing another record, I, I probably would have slapped you silly. Um, the thing about this band, I, I do believe Jeff said this to you as well, is that uh, it's kind of instinct once we get together to start writing and to start exploring things. And it may be just a small idea, but it becomes something else. So by the, you know, it's just natural that we will go in and start writing again. So looking at the Moist discography, if the video game Guitar Hero approached you and said they wanted just one song, one Moist song to put in a future Guitar Hero game that fans could play along to, what what Moist song do you provide to Guitar Hero? Uh, Shriek and Love, because I want to hear guitar players playing uh, my keyboard solos for a change. I like it. I like it. Uh, so for our listeners that are gearheads that want to know how you achieve your signature sound, can you share uh, a little bit about what you're playing for, for keys or for effects or for, I don't know, anything you can give to the gearheads that want to know this stuff? Uh, I'll start by saying one of the things that we learned early on with Moist is because of the, because we wanted to stay out of each other's business in terms of, of uh, uh, you know, staying out of the range of their harmonic range of the guitar, staying out of the range of, um, we, four years, and I've used four years, a similar Roland uh, keyboard sound from the uh, piano sound from back in the day uh, as the basis for pretty much most of, most of Silver and iterations of that for a lot of the piano on the, on the albums after that. Uh, we did a lot of acoustic piano as well. Um, over time, the gear that I've used has expanded substantially. Uh, I started piano and organ, just synth, whatever I had in my Roland D70 that I had back in the day. Um, I started adding Wurlitzer, which is sitting behind me, one of my favorite instruments of all time. Um, Mercedes involved a lot of sampling of sounds created on a variety of different keyboards, Nord lead, uh, an, an early organ, uh, uh, not early organ, an organ simulator that was meant to be like AM and B, but a digital recreation. Uh, and now everything is basically, uh, it's, since, since the last record, after the last record, I moved and reprogrammed everything. So everything is now in main stage. With the exception of some synthesizer work that I do. I like having a one synthesizer with me so I can fiddle buttons and make, you know, this will make, make sounds that will make animals scream live uh, and, and do some fiddling about in, in real time. What, what would you say uh, over your lengthy career, what would you say is your favorite fan interaction? It could be something memorable or funny or sweet or touching. I'm going to go for, I'm going to go with one that there have been, we've had a lot of wonderful fan interactions. We've had people come to us and say, you know, your music made a difference for me. That's, those are the kind uh, that, that are the most important because there's music that made a difference for me that made, made me feel better. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to go with a humorous one. I was in Ireland traveling. My wife and I were there. Uh, we were in Galway and I walked into this pub we're hanging out in this pub and uh, I, I believe my wife brought up that, that I played in a band that once toured Britain and the bartender lost his shit and said, 
Ron Wood came in here. This is as good as that. And I, I looked at him and I just went, dude, you, you got to get out more because me, Ron Wood. Yeah. I think, I think I, it stepped down, but it was so funny because this is, was like 2016, 2015, who knows? And this was years and years after, but he remembered us from playing from, because we had played top of the pops in Britain. So strangest, most unlooked for, interaction ever that's amazing and uh you guys made some unique merchandise for the uk market can you can you share that story yeah so uh we we were often covered in Kerrang magazine uh whose who, who, writers often said you know these guys aren't metal enough big surprise we weren't metal enough but we were popular enough in britain that you know we we're we were fun to kick around a little bit right and it didn't matter all press is good press but uh, the British have this tendency to slag off uh, other artists. And uh, a lead singer from a band called Reef said, oh yeah, Moist. What do you, he was asked, what do you think of Moist? And he was like, Moist, they're dog shit times 10. So we went, that's, that's brilliant. Uh, so we made our own dog shit times 10 t-shirts and sold them. I'm pretty sure we had some left over for here, but mostly in the UK. And they did well, so you know, my, my, I'm always appreciative of uh, where bad press can take it. I feel like you should bring out that that T-shirt for any upcoming shows. I feel like they could be hot. They could sell like hotcakes. It, it could be T-shirts. T-shirts have become one of my. Fa- I'm, I'm actually wearing a T-shirt I made myself with Spider-Man on it, so it, 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 it harkens back to that. But yeah, let's. Uh... We made it all the way to the newest album. So 2022, uh, End of the Ocean. So three singles, Tarantino, End of the Ocean, Put the Devil on It. I- I'd like you to take a-, a little bit of time to talk about the recording of this. This is a pandemic album. Uh, this is a challenging album. And then we can dive into the, the results after that. Okay, so uh, we actually started recording it as, uh, as we did uh, Glory, getting together in Revolution uh, recording in Toronto all together. And a lot of uh, what made the record did come from those sessions. Uh, but all the overdubbing, all the, uh, basically the pandemic was declared when we were in Revolution. So uh, Mark basically said, let's get together in a couple of weeks when this is all over. And we know how that turned out. So the room that I'm talking to you from is uh, where I did a lot of my recording, uh, vocals, a little bit of trumpet, um, all the keys. Uh, but we also had a we also had a bunch of keys and a bunch of uh, other stuff that Mark wove together from the sessions. But it was uh, bar none uh, my least favorite recording experience is to record alone. There uh, we very much feed off each other and um, act as a filter. I'm very much a, a, a kitchen sink guy. Like I, I, I haven't met a sound that I don't want to put on top of another sound in a song. And I have to be reined in, I have to be brought back and said enough. Um, so not being able to do that in real time with the guys, on the one hand, it's not as fun, On the other hand, it allowed each of us to explore things that we wouldn't have explored before. And I think that's where some of uh, some of the magic of of this last record, for me anyway, uh, comes from from being surprised by something that I didn't hear in real time. Jeff sent it to me and said, what do you think of this? What can you do with this? You know, or or David saying, hey, but how how about you play this here? You know, I mean, it was. uh, it, it was, we were able to go down individual rabbit holes, which I think particularly for vocals was, was, was fascinating. So my favorite, my three favorite songs on the album are Party's Over, so not a single. Uh, so Party's Over, Tarantino, and End of the Ocean. I find that Party's Over, the chorus just like explodes at you. Like it's one of the best choruses on the album. And I mentioned before, I had this album in my top nine albums of 2022, the year it was released. And I'm going to make a bold statement, okay? I'm going to make a bold statement. I believe this is the band's second best album just behind Creature. Kevin, am I crazy? Am I crazy or is this one of the band's best albums? Absolute batshit. Absolute batshit. No, I, I, 
<laughs> now, I, you know, I, uh, I don't know. Are you crazy? Uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's uh, the record that most people would say that about. Uh, I don't know how I, where it fits in for me. Um, but, you know, I'm a guy who, there are records that have been huge records for bands. And I'm like, yeah, that's okay. But I prefer this one. It's a very individual thing, you know. Uh, if, what resonates with someone at a given time is, it, you know, it can't, cannot be predicted. So, no, you're not crazy. Um, and I, very nice to hear uh, because you want people to like your late career work uh, or let's call it mid-career work as much as, uh, as much as they did your earlier stuff. Well, I might be crazy. I'm not not certified yet, but uh, we're, we're working towards it. So the 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 pandemic decimated all these different industries, and the music industry, the live event industry, was hit harder than almost any other industry. How did how did the pandemic affect your life? So we already talked about how it shifted how you were able to record the new album, but outside of that. How did the pandemic affect you and how did you adapt your life and your career to the last two or three years? Well, one of the things for me, knowing that there wouldn't be gigs, uh, first of all, you know, I, I, I said at one point, I said to my wife at one point, this is, this will have about six months in to the pandemic. I said, this will have been the longest time that I have not been playing some form of live show since I was about nine years old. So that was really odd. Um, as you know, as I mentioned, I'm a freelance writer. Uh, I thought, no problem. You know, there'll be lots to write about. Immediately writing, because I was writing a lot about audio, that started to tank as well. That came back very quickly. Um, really, I, I could go on about what I learned over the pandemic, what I did over the pandemic. But one of, one of the things that became valuable for me, actually, as a musician, is that I started to play for fun again. Mm. Now, I always played a bit for fun, but I had more time on my hands. And I did, after the album was recorded, which took a lot of time, after the album was recorded, I was all geared up. I wanted to play. I wanted to go out. I wanted to get do what we always do. And I couldn't. So I sat at home and played whatever I felt like, learned songs that I'd always wanted to learn. Uh, old, old stuff from my uh, from my you know studying classical music days. Old and some jazz standards, some bits that you know just pick a song a day and go after it. Um, I learned I learned the value of music, not only having lost the ability to go out and play and be with my friends who I work with, and and meet all the people who come to see us and have that wonderful live experience, but I learned the value of music for me as something to keep me on an even keel and something that will always, regardless of whether I'm playing in a band or what I'm doing, will always be something that I can go to, that I, a place where I have a home, just me sitting in front of a keyboard going, I wonder how I can get this done. And did you pick up any new hobbies during the pandemic? Some people learned how to bake bread. Some people um, started a, a, uh, a garden outside. Did you start anything new? Or just dove into music? Not really. I, I, I dug into music a fair bit. I, uh, the pandemic was about letting some, letting some new hobbies go, really. Uh, but I, 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 uh, I played a lot. I got more, I took, I took more pictures. Uh, I'm not, I, I like to take pictures, but I am the most amateur of amateur photographers. I, my whole thing is trying to get something to look to appear in a way that it shouldn't appear. I, I don't know I, I, how to put it other than that's fast. When I look at what I've taken and I go, I, 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 I've never seen that like that before. That's, I am not a photographer, but I, I'm, I dabble. I explored my creativity in a variety of different ways. Over, over the pandemic because all that energy that goes into making music and making a tour happen and rehearsing, all of that was gone. I missed it desperately. I needed something else to do. So, and uh, 
you know, I dug into prior to the pandemic, I, uh, a few years ago, I wanted to get back in shape. Um, friends were saying, you should do yoga. I'm more of a high impact guy. Like I, I, I like to cycle. I like this. I, I skateboarded a lot as a kid and still do it occasionally. Um, so, and I found a boxing trainer around the corner from my house. So uh, I hung a heavy bag in my backyard, uh, got on the internet and just went nuts training. So you, you, you say you're a, an amateur photographer, but some of your pictures ended up as a part of the artwork for the new album. Is that correct? It is. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we, we went through getting any artwork done or, or, or frankly, t-shirts done from Moist is because we're all so involved in every element of the creative process. It's difficult. Um, but uh, I just floated this picture that seemed to capture what we were talking about in terms of there being a, uh, a focus on the record of 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 you know, this this damage that we're doing to ourselves and to and to our environment and our world on on small scale and large scale uh, in large small scale and large scale ways and it was just this picture I'd taken of a seascape through a dirty ferry window at some point um, and that was really rewarding. That uh, again, just another another thing to dabble in, another creative outlook, element. Um, you know, like like I say, like making my own T-shirt or uh, finding some way to uh, you know take one idea and turn it into something that uh, fires some creative uh, some creative force in it. So I have a hypothetical question. Let's say we fast forward into the future. We're looking a hundred years ahead, 500 years ahead. So let's say in the distant future, most of today's music has faded from public consciousness. However, there's oh. one, there's one moist song that stands the test of time in 500 years. It's, it's been oh. saved in a capsule. Humans are somehow still listening to it. What moist song do you choose to represent you, the band and the band's music. So it doesn't have to be based on the most popular song, but for you, one Moy song is still here in the future. Which song is it? This is a tough question, man. You guys have a lot of songs. Virtually, my first imp impulse is to say, does it have to be a Moy song? Uh, but yeah, okay, so, um, wow. You know what? I'm gonna go with Resurrection. I'm going to go with resurrection because a uh, hundred years in the future, who knows what's going to be happening. Um, and uh, maybe the idea of resurrection will be a, a, a compelling, uh, a compelling thing to uh, drive someone at that point. Maybe, uh, maybe 500 years in the future with technology, with uh, resurrection, maybe they'll, they'll find your, your bones, your DNA, and they'll reconstruct you with, with your consciousness. Who knows? Who knows what happens? Well, you know, maybe before that time, I will have found a way to get myself cryogenically freeze, frozen, and uh, we'll wake up 500 years from now and go, okay. Where's Here we game? go. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready to play Resurrection Live now that everyone's listening to it in 500 years. Um, so you, you've you had a lengthy career. We're talking about it's been, you know, 30 years as a as a band now. Um, how do you keep this fun? You look like you're having a great time. How, how do you do this? Uh, the band's family. I've, I've played with uh, uh, played with a lot of other people over time. I've enjoyed it. Um, but the band is family. Um, when I work with David or I, I, on his solo stuff, or I work with the guys in the band, you know, I'm, you know, I'm seeing Mark for dinner this weekend. We're all friends. We're all, we remain very close friends. Um, and making music, regardless of whether it's with the band, making music with Jerry and, and Brian for Brian's band. I played a bunch of Floyd shows with uh, classic albums live in Toronto doing those. Wonderful. Being on stage with, with, with a nine or 11 piece band and recreating a wall for a bunch of people who are excited, you know, making music, playing live is, is the most fun that you can possibly have. Uh, it, 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 there are a whole bunch of things that can be a drag in between there. There, you know, sometimes, sometimes it can be grueling. Sometimes you're bitchy. Sometimes you're fighting with people you love. But at the end of the day, you get to make music together. And it, it just, there's just no better, as my good 
good friend Jerry Finn would say to me back in the day, geez, Kev, aren't we blessed to do this? And it's true. So the, the, I have one final quote, and there's no better quote than from a fellow uh, Moise family member. So this is from drummer Francis Fillion. Uh, he says, Kev is one of the funniest guys I know. Sometimes when, when I have a bad night or a problem getting into the show, I watch Kevin playing his keys with all his energy and conviction, and it puts me right back in the show. So that's from Francis. That's lovely. I, I, I love playing with Francis. Um, you know, I, I have to say that we've been very lucky over time. I've been very lucky over time to have played with a lot of really, really fine drummers. Um, and, and Francis is, uh, is uh, one of those fine drummers. And, and, and he is unstoppable. I can't imagine him not even, I can't imagine him. I feel the same way about him. He does about me because I look over at him and he's just laying it down. I, it's impossible not to just smile and, you know, it, it's, it's just a lovely thing to hear from him. So we're down to the final handful of questions here. These are the, the fire. these are the deeper, uh, we, we don't have time for rapid fire to, to stick to, uh, stick to the, uh, the schedule here, but, uh, these are the deeper, more meaningful questions. Can you handle a few deep ones? Yeah. If the, if, if the last two hours haven't been deep enough, these are going a little further. Um, do you, do you have any dreams in your heart that you still haven't attained that you're still working towards? I mean, you've accomplished more than most musicians, anything you still have in your heart that you're dreaming about. Uh, you know, I, uh, one, of, one of my fondest dreams is that I get to keep doing this in one form or fashion for the rest of my life. A long life, long life, not like sudden death or anything. Yeah. So there's that. When, uh, when you look back on your life and career, what are you most proud of and most grateful for? My, oh, oh. I'm grateful that so many people were moved enough by our music to, be, to allow us to do this for as long as we have. That's what you're most grateful for. And what are you most proud of looking back at your life and career? Any big proud moments that stand out? or the whole career as a whole. It's, it's hard to nail any one thing down. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm proud that I, you know what? Yeah, sure. I'm proud that I've been able to maintain so many good friendships with so many people that I've worked with both in music and in writing and through what I've done it as a career in my life and have those, that brotherhood and, and, and that, that, uh, that, that friendship still there to this day. So we have a tradition on the podcast where the last guest will leave a question for the next guest without knowing who it is. Uh, so we have a question for you. This is from Chris Gormley, the drummer for the Trues. And his question is, what do you love most about what you do? Uh, performing live. The performing live without a doubt. And the, and the travel, which I, is so critical to me. Uh, as both as a part of voice, as a, as a musician and as, as a human in general. And can you, can you now pay it forward and provide a question for the next guest? And, uh, you know, usually I know who the next guest is and I, I can let you know once you've provided the question, but in this case, I'm about to book the next uh, group of guests. So I don't actually know who it is, so I can't give you any hints. Okay, so I'm going to ask this. I'm going to ask when you have to learn a song or yeah, when you have to learn a part or relearn a part really quickly, what's your practice hack? What's the best way to do that? What would you say to someone who has another player who has to do that or singer or whatever you happen to, uh, or writer, if you're speaking to someone whose main gig is writing? Perfect, that's a good question. And uh, final question, if you could go back in time and you could sit down next to your 10 year old self. So you can take all the lessons you've learned over the years, all the mentorship and training and goals and achievements and the tough times. What advice can you give to cute little Kevin sitting there to help guide him through this human existence, this life we have? 
Uh, I, you know, I would, I would say in all seriousness, I would say, don't let other people define you. You can do whatever you want. There are no rules. I would add to him at some point, you're going to get a student loan. What you want to do is skip school and sync all of that into Microsoft or Apple. That is tremendous financial advice. Uh, where, where can our listeners find you online? If they want to, uh, either with the Moy stuff, if they want to stay in the loop with upcoming shows or upcoming releases, and then you personally, if they want to see what you're up to with the writing, the photography, the music, or they want to slide into the DMs, if they need a keyboard player for something, where do people go? Uh, so I can be a uh, best way to reach me in, in, over social media is either through the moist account or, or through my own, uh, through the moist IG account or through my own, uh, Instagram account, uh, Kevin underscore young underscore road think. Um, I also have a website, which is really, really out of date, but, uh, should be relaunching hopefully sometime this month, which is Kevin Um, and it will be relaunching more as a, uh, predominantly freelance writing focused, uh, site. And is there anything you'd like to say to the fans that have been with you from the very start, regardless of whether it's with Moist or David or solo as a writer, photographer, just fans that have stuck with you through everything, any, anything you'd like to say with them, any final parting words here? Just that heartfelt thank you that so many people, uh, both fans and colleagues have, allowed me over time to be create to expand and explore and expand my creative creativity in so many different ways. Um, and, uh, you know, especially moist fans because that started it all and it's still the best gig in the world. So as we wrap up, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge you, Kevin, for your lifelong pursuit of mastery as a, as a musician, as a writer. Uh, I want to thank you for putting out some all-time great music like the album Creature that uh, I've been a fan of forever and, and has you know, it made a big imprint on me as a musician, as a guitarist, as a singer, and, and, you know, might've had a big influence on what I, what I did since then. Uh, maybe I wouldn't be into music as much as I am now, if it didn't take that album, getting its claws in me at an early age. Uh, I want to thank you for continuing the moist legacy by putting out end of the ocean. The new music to me is as good as the very pinnacle of moist stuff back in the day. Uh, so I love that you guys keep that, keep that train rolling. And uh, last but not least, I want to thank you, uh, uh, just as a fan for this interview, sitting down with me for the last two hours, answering my question, my questions. And again, I've been a fan since I was 11 years old. So that's a lot of years of built, built up questions I've wanted to know about, uh, about the music. Uh, so it means a lot. So thank you so much, Kevin. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time to, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And it's a day when you're talking to someone about music is a good day. So thank you. That's very true. You're very welcome. So to uh, the listeners of the podcast, to the Kevin fans, to the Moist fans, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode. If you've enjoyed today's episode of the podcast, please take a moment to subscribe, like, comment, and share. What I want to know is who would you like me to sit down with next for a two-hour deep dive interview? You can let me know by reaching out to me on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at Joel Martin Mastery. Joel is J-O-E-L. And you can find me on Twitter and Snapchat at Joel Mastery. So I am done. I am complete. I approve this message. And I'll see you on the next episode.